Hello and welcome to Property Mastermind Podcast, episode 160. Today, Bob and I will be talking about joint ventures. So this is Joint Ventures Unpacked. You're going to learn what we went through at our joint venture two-day workshop this weekend or last weekend in Sydney. And this will open your eyes to what's actually possible to you to do either more property developments, should you have a few on the way and feel like you don't have enough money right now, or whether you need people to join you with money so you can do them. So let's jump on into episode 160. Hello and welcome to episode 160. Hey Bob. Hey, how are you going? Listen to both of our throats. I'm, I'm still pumped up. <laughs> oh my gosh, I was so exhausted. But last night I was in bed by about eight o'clock. Anyway, we just had our two-day joint venture workshop in Sydney. It was an amazing event, absolutely chockers. We'll get to that shortly. And I thought the podcast today is going to unpack what we went through in that to open your eyes to what's actually possible for you. But before we get started, the book goes to Emmett. I was like, I'm a hand, I'm a chain, I'm a, I'm not sure how you say your last name, Emmett. Now, Bob and I met Emmett uh, a few weeks ago out one night. We'd been for dinner and we we're having a couple of drinks afterwards. And we ended up chatting with Emmett. He recognised us and it was uh, a fun night. So, Emmett, I didn't forget. And it is in the post to you tomorrow. Well, you might even get it by the time this comes out. So, Bob, have you got a tip for us this week? I knew you were going to do that. Mm-hmm. And so, like any good Boy Scout, I came prepared. Yeah. I went to a bookshelf and I raided a little book of yours called Daily Mantras. Yes. Had a quick flip. Sounds like a me thing. Here it is. This is my one for today. Okay. It isn't where you came from. It's where you're going that counts. Oh, my goodness. That's like three wines in. Draw a line in the sand today. And it's about where you choose to go tomorrow. Mm. And so how does that relate to property development for you? Well, I, I often say to people something that's fairly similar to that. I said, look, it doesn't matter where you start, it's where you finish. Mm. So it, that might mean, look, you might just start on the world's smallest property development. That's okay. Do it, learn, get confidence, move on. It, it can take many forms, what, uh, what that might mean. Or even when you're negotiating. And negotiating negotiations, <laughs> they can ebb and flow and go up and down. So it, it's not really where you start, it's where you finish, hey? Mm. Well, as soon as you start talking about something, then my brain just goes on to, oh, negotiations. Or we were talking with a mentoring student recently about negotiations and how to do them. But then another one recently, if you read last week's email about Tom, hey, Tom, he just put an offer in and they accepted it. We're like, what? Yeah, Who, yeah below, and, below where he was willing to go. Yeah, that was a starting offer. He had an ending offer. He put it in and they took it. We're like, how good is that? Started and ended in a better place. It did. Now, I'm concerned, Bob. I'm going to have to put something under your mic. Okay, okay lift just, the mic up. Lift the mic. I'm getting yeah. too tall. The editor, I'm getting taller as I get older. The editor will be like, Bob's, maybe, Bob's mouth too far from his mic. Maybe I should just adjust my seat. <laughs> I'm not sure. But anyway, we're going to talk about our two-day workshop that we had in the Gold Coast. And to put it in perspective, when we do our three-day workshop, which is uh, in November this year on the, I should know these dates, on the 11th, 12, uh, sorry, October 11, 12, 13 in the Gold Coast. So that's three days on property development. Mm. And Bob spends about two hours over those three days on finance and oh, on joint ventures and on joint ventures. Oh, just on joint ventures, probably longer on finance. Hey, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who yeah. knows? Hour and a half. Yeah. So three, two hours. Three and a half between all of it. So we ended up doing two full days on it. So can you imagine two days solid. how micro it went? So how people they left absolutely fizzing, didn't they? Joint ventures on steroids. And the great thing is it opened people's eyes and so many people, somebody who I've seen at events for like has come along so many times. He just said, oh, my goodness, I wish I knew about this a long time ago. So you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And he was kind of like, and I, so ho- hello to you. Yeah, well, uh, we, did, we did really dig deep. As you can imagine, a subject like that, when you go for two days, it's, it's digging deep on it. Yeah, and it opens the door. It opens your eyes up to things. Lots of light bulbs flashing. People were telling me in the morning tea break, lunchtime, oh, my God, I've, this light bulb came on, you know. Three years I never knew that or 
if I'd known that then, then I could have this, you know, yeah. it was ha- happening all weekend. Oh, my goodness. And so we've got, this was the manual that we had for the weekend. What I have to say was our best manual ever. Yeah. It's yeah, you, just, and, you and Georgia did a gun job. Yeah, they did. And I don't they know. Did, she, you did? Were you in the, there? The Georgia printer, was in it. Georgia, was she, in it. She, yeah, she went through and created it. But the, she did. It, it actually is. It did was a cracker job. Epic. And i tell you what happened. Let's discuss Carlos. Okay. So we, Bob and I hang out with our people. We're not like people that you may use as mentors in any environment or any arena. It doesn't matter, you know, where they're from. We actually, or what space you're in we actually hang out the whole time and we put out a vip ticket and said let's just see if anyone buys that but because we've never done it before it was that wasn't even it was george's idea it's yeah like george is in the office and just our marketing that was a good idea. so we put it out there but we forgot that we'd put it out and then then somebody bought one and we thought oh my goodness somebody's bought a vip ticket <laughs> <laughs> so we went down a day early and went for dinner with carlos that bought it Blew his mind because he got to sit there and ask uh, Bob, Aaron and myself questions and, and brought his partner along and we had dinner. He was hardly eating. Oh, he was fizzing. It, it just, it just, it was a life game changer for him. He said he, what he got out of that dinner was just the best thing ever. And then we spent the rest of the weekend sort of treating him. He got VIP status, <laughs> he got gifts, he sat at the front of the room. It was awesome. Yeah. But what the reason we went over the top for Carlos was because he invested in himself and to you mm. and I that's important yeah yeah and then that's a, we just we know it's going to change his life moving forward it already is yeah it already has yeah that's <laughs> the thing it already has so well done for him doing that but anyway today's podcast is about all of the weekend and what we went over and what happened mm. so I printed out the timetable so we I thought we'd go through it like that yep. but first of all Bob let's talk about how many people uh, turn up or buy tickets late for events? Uh, look, I told you it happened. You knew it was going to happen. It's happened for as long as I've been running events. And look, I've done 80, 83-day workshops, and goodness knows how many one and twos. It's never any different. You, you can have an early bird special at a discount, and yeah, sure, you'll get, you'll get some people in that. And invariably, it's the last week. I, I don't know why. Do they think they're going to get a better offer? That would be stupid. What better offer could you get? And then all of a sudden they get this rush in the last week. I mm. just don't know, but it, it is always the case. Problem is you've got a hot event like this and the gate's already shown. And it's not, it wasn't a networking event. It's a one-off event. So it's a that was a one-off event teaching stuff that mm. nobody else does or can no. to, at the level that, that you can or we can. And... Uh, we had to say no to some people. Some people just couldn't come. No, we just these things have to be booked months in advance. You know, you've got to uh, book a, hos- a hospital. I nearly said <laughs> book a <laughs> hospital. Book a hospital. Yeah, book a hotel. You got to get a room. You got to choose the size of the room. Catering and catering. I mean, fulfill, fulfill want to. Uh, and you can't just keep adding people, adding people, adding people because there's a cut off. You know, when the room's full. It's full. And we added an extra table. We just mm. did it anyway. It also made the room quite cramped. And then somebody who was an, a mentoring student from 10 years ago, he rang and said, oh, Hilary, I just really want to come. And I said, oh, seriously, you just can't. You, we, we, there are, we are already packed out. There are no extra seats. There are just none. And in the end, he goes, I'll just stand at the back of the room. And I said, Okay, if you prefer to stand at the back of the room, you can come. But anyway, he was very, he sat at the sort of side table with me. That, that's how full it was. But and he just said he actually sent me an email this week mm. and said this is excellent. Thanks so that's much. Right, yeah. And that's he's been developing. He did the mentoring program ten years ago. He's been developing for all this time, and he, he came and said it was a phenomenal event. So it just shows mm. that you know the content was epic. And then we had um, Ross Roxon uh, flies in from Bali. Ah. Oh. What a legend. He's hilarious. He's He was like eight years ago through the program. So yep. there was some old and new and brand new and it was amazing. Yeah. A heap of men, past and current mentoring people there, but lots yep. of people, people had done the course, maybe hadn't done the mentoring program. Yep. And, and a few people just decided, you know, out of the blue, didn't know much about us at all, but um, just sounded too good and it to was. pass up. But anyway, the whole leaving it to the last minute, please, everybody, that has to stop because you will you'll get a no. But anyway, Bob, let's go through what we did. Yep. So we started off with you know talking about what joint ventures were and actually 
saying what they actually are, not just that throwaway comment pack, mm. you know, understanding that there are varying types and what they look like. And then we went into finance. Let's yeah. quickly talk about, Bob, what finance was about. Well, j- just to set the tone for that, it, the weekend was about joint ventures. Yes. But it's not enough to know joint ventures, to do joint ventures. And there's two parts that are very critical. One's finance, mm. because you can't do a joint venture if you don't understand finance and all the different ways you can structure finance. You also have to know how to structure a deal uh, and how to crunch the numbers. Because if you can't crunch the numbers, do the feasibility, in other words, then you can't work out the finance. If you can't work out the finance, then you can't put anything together for an investor. So we did do some of that as well. But back to the finance, really important. I did. I went in quite, into quite a, quite a lot of detail yeah. on finance. I mean, initially... I had to explain the difference between retail and commercial finance. Yeah. Because a lot of people, particularly if they're new to property development, don't understand that. The The only finance they understand is the finance they got when they bought the house or an investment property. And with property development, it's very different. Just you know, purely on the serviceability situation. Uh, it, it, you know, it's n- not a necessity like it is with uh, with others. And you know, then we, then we dug deeper on that. We talked about... Uh, difference between you know retail and commercial finance. Then we talked about commercial finance, but banks and the and the sort of three types of commercial finance. We talked about banks, non banks, private equity, and then we had a look at all the differences between the two in terms of the the loan to value ratios that they lend on, interest rates, application fees, line fees, line fees, all the different quirks, things to watch out for. Mm. Uh, questions that you probably wouldn't even know to ask mm. uh, that, you know, mean something. You don't want to get a shock when you get your offer to sign. You think you got your finance sorted, you got the written offer from the financier and you start finding stuff in there that you didn't know about or didn't think to ask about. Uh, so, yeah, we dug pretty pretty deep on that. Yeah. That were... was an eye-opener for so many people. Oh, because, such an eye-opener. Yeah, a lot of people understand the difference between retail and commercial finance, but but not when you start really digging deep on on non-bank and private equity funding and all those, uh, mm. you know, things that I love to talk about. Oh, yeah, people were saying that Bob's in at the element. I was like, yeah, he's loving oh, it, living the dream out there. <laughs> oh, no. Meanwhile, I think I was asleep in the corner. Yeah, Danny Simrani took my photo while I was having a sleep. He goes, I took, took this. I'm going to use this to blackmail you one day. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, you got to realise I don't care. So, 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 hey, Danny, how you going, mate? You've heard it yeah. too many times. Yeah, oh, he, just, he did get a photo of me sleeping in, funny. The, in the far corner, as you might on occasion. Day two, to be fair, and stuff I've heard a few times before, a few hundred million. Mm. But anyway, then we went on to structure, which is vital. And I think most people are fairly aware of structure right now, but then just the different ways that you can structure things. And, and I think because of the calibre of people in the room, they – most people are all over. I, I well, can't there are, people they're weren't. over the basic structures. Yeah. But when, you, when you're when doing a joint venture, you add a whole new element to oh, it. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at personal structure. Yeah. Oh, yeah from the other side. You're the, thinking about the projects you do by yeah. yourself, and that's, that's relatively straightforward. Yes. But still not an off-the-shelf thing. It's not one one thing fits all, even, yeah. even individually. Mm. But when you add another party into it or you're raising some funds, that that's when it can get a lot more complicated. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, we... We dug really deep on that. Yeah, but uh, I was like, for me, it was like for some people, it was sleepy, sleepy. a little bit over the top. <laughs> yeah. Others, yeah, it's like that, you know. Well, you know, from the personality profiling you mm. do, some people just want the detail. You know, down take take me to the micro detail. I need to know all this. Yeah. Other people just want the broad brush. But then you only need to know it when you need to know it and that's the other thing so yeah. when you are opening opening people's eyes to opportunities that are out there for them or how they can do it that's when it was making sense mm. for people and they were very interested so yeah. the structures were important then we went on to um some rules for equity yeah so we often get the question from people how much money do i need to do a project how much equity do i have to put in how much of my own money do I have to put in mm. to do a project? So obviously you have to put your own money in. If you're buying a house, you call it a deposit, but in property development, we call it equity. So you have to put a certain amount of equity into the deal first up front, and then the financier will put the rest in. And good old financier, they put in most of it. They might be putting in, you know, 70%, maybe even 
you know, seventy five percent or whatever it is, eighty percent even of the money that you need to do a project, but you have to put some in and you have to put in first. Mm. And so a lot of people say, well, how, how much, much money do I need? Yeah, yeah, how much money do I need? Yeah. Well, I mean, it does depend on the size of the project, obviously. Yeah. You know, the bigger the project, the more you have to put in and, that, and the type of project and where it is. It could be a very expensive area. It might not be. So they're, they're the variables. But we like to – I like thumb rules. Remember, like a thumb rule isn't an absolute – it's not 100% accurate. But it's a general it, guideline. General guideline. gives you a pretty good indication. Yeah. And so I went through some thumb rules that uh, you can use to work out how much equity you need to do a project. And that was based on some different financiers, different types of financiers who lend at different you know, LVRs, different loan to value ratios. And we start rocket science to know that if a financier lends at a high loan to value ratio, the more money they give you, the less you put in. And uh, of course, banks being more conservative, they put in uh, less than you know, non-banks private equity. Mm. And so we had some good little thumb rules there to have a quick a quick look. It was a bit of a relationship hey, between the, the market values and, and finance and, and what your equity is. So, yeah, a quickie. I love thumb rules. Yeah, everyone loves, everyone a, good loves a thumb rule. Because, because basically we're lazy. <laughs> yeah. or, or, well, it or gives you an idea on, on whether yeah. to move forward or not, or whether yeah. you can. Yeah. yeah. I think it, it's, it gives you a pretty good indication without spending a lot of time working it out. Because mm. anyway, I, I spent a lot of time working it out to make the thumb rule. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's like 40 years later, you know, that, that you, you probably came up with it. You, you saw a pattern after a while saying, mm. ah, it was that. Yeah. That's my guess. Is that how it happened? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah pretty and much. It's just math. Yeah. It's all math. But not, mm. a lot of people don't like it. No, I can imagine. Give me a thumb rule. Then we went on to attracting investors. Which, oh, well, that was a big one. You, you you did that one. Yeah. And what's important, you know, your your branding or just what how you portray yourself. So, but with that came... Perception. Yeah, perception. But also as professionalism. And you have to know what you're talking about. You can't just kind of bumble up to someone and and... Not a good look when you're trying to convince an investor to come in and and yeah well yeah and, you, and even that though the mindset side of that mm. being you know it's actually an opportunity rather than thinking you're asking or looking for it's mm. really you are t attracting someone to give them an opportunity and when you start seeing that differently yeah. it differently happens differently then we went on to oh that's about enough about that section oh I well think. that was your section but it was yeah. a good one yeah it was a good one I talk about the importance of which you don't. Which it's, social media you need, yeah. and which information memorandums, and what they should look like, and what needs to go into them, and that sort of thing. You don't, you don't get that. I haven't seen that outside. The, the depth and the knowledge that you put into, you know, how, how to set yourself up to be attractive for investors, and how to deal with investors, and you know, that's that's fairly unique. Well, that we dealing with them it was we came a bit later. The next thing we did was mm. feasibilities, and yep. um, that was well, that's important. You know, getting the numbers right. Anybody can punch out some numbers, but are they right? And if they're wrong, what, what might that mean? Well, it might mean you buy a property that you think is good, stacks up, it's going to make a lot of profit. Turns out it's got not. your numbers wrong, it doesn't. Mm. The problem with that is you don't. if you make a mistake and get it wrong, you often don't know straight away. Mm. You won't know until you get further down the track. But, I mean, anyone can buy a property with, you know, say a normal property, no development permit. Anyone can buy that. Now... If you've done your numbers right, you buy it so that you can get the approvals, get the you know, do the construction, sell it and make money. But a lot of people don't. Own, they buy it, they get the approvals, and it's not until they reach the stage, you know, where they're construction stage, where they start talking to builders and and all the numbers come together, talking to financiers, talking to valuers. The valuers will know. They'll do the numbers. And, and the valuers' numbers could, in some cases, are very different from – what some people had done who don't know what they're doing or did it incorrectly, and, and then the wheels fall off then. Yeah. So the wheels can fall off six, no eight, one nine, wants a bad valuation. months down the road. Yeah. No, it doesn't help. With finance. So, yeah, that's why the numbers, the feasibility is just so critical in, in getting it right. And, you know, the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. And I, I see that with, with people that, um, you know, haven't been taught properly, haven't learned how to do it, leave things out. You leave costs out, you make it look better than it is. Uh, not good. Well, what about people that? So we, you know, we've got our 
feasibility calculator, which you use for everything. Yeah. We're talking from buying, I mean, building retirement villages, 99 houses to a duplex or a two lot subdivision. So what, what do you love about our feasibility calculator or feasibility calculators have you i mean i know we've yeah, you can, since you can, got you state master pay, for something else oh, you can pay big dollars our state master is a great one yep. a lot of the values use it but it's two and a half thousand a year yeah uh, you can't buy it you license it you know it's yep. licensed you can rent a, <laughs> rent a feasibility and, and and you know there's others out there fee study but what i love about ours is it's really easy to use and it's not clunky Mm. It's accurate. Does all sorts of things. You know, you you put the inputs in, hit the green button, it'll do the rest. But it's got all the inputs that you need to put in, so you don't know that you may have missed something, or yeah. it, it's got everything you need, and push a button, and it gives you everything you need to know. Well, you've got to need to know what to put in there. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, um, yeah when, once you put the the data in, you get summary pages, you get um, pie charts and Gantt charts, you get. Uh, Oh, it's got a little calculator on it where you can work out exactly, you know, the size of the loan you need, what sort of equity you need to put in. You know, you can you can set a margin on cost with, that you're trying to hit and it'll tell you how much you can pay for the land and no more. It's, it's just full of functions. Mm. But I love using it because it's simple and it's quick and it's accurate. So we went through... Uh, a feasibility calculator, but just just to show yeah, people how that yeah how that all works. Hmm. Then we did a case study. Yeah, so Aaron interviewed a couple of people. Yeah, uh, he did that. Current yes. past mentoring students who are doing projects, uh, just about their project. Because oh, they're using joint ventures, so yeah, because they're joint they, ventures. How and they came about and, and how interesting using ones them. too. More yeah. than just one person doing a joint venture with another. Yeah, when there's hundreds of them going on in our community, but. Um, I remember the first one, and it was an upmarket duplex. Mm. And what made that a little bit different is that the the developer is actually an investor in another project with somebody else. And mm. now this one is his own project, uh, and he put some of his own money in, but he also uh, accepted some some capital from two other investors. And now we're using who, who were using their self managed super funds. I was kind of involved. We never mentioned that on the weekend, but. You were involved. I in was that. involved with that because he and I were having a conversation. He's a mentoring student. He goes, oh, I've got one investor now. I'm just looking for X amount. And I said, oh, I actually know because I'd been recently talking to someone. I said, I actually know somebody was super that had actually come to me and said, Hilary, I've got X amount in super. And, and he's, Did, do you know of anybody? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll just keep that up my sleeve. Yeah. So it turned out, I happened to be talking to the developer uh, because he's in the mentoring program, and I said, well, I might be able to help you out, which was great because, yeah, that's nice. It's, yeah. It was actually another mentoring student. It was a mentoring going to another yeah, mentoring, yeah. but it's kind of nice uh, when you can. Well, you're, you're, the, um, you're, in, you're the big introducer. Yeah, it was I good. It was nice to but be that. that was good because it's self-managed so far. It wasn't, they're not boots and all in the project. They're not equity in the project. They're no. loans. They can use their super. Don't they? So, so they were the two case studies. So yeah. it's good to unpack those and show people what's yeah, possible. What's when it's a little twists and turns in that yeah. one, which is good. Yeah, they start off on their own and at what stage they bring yeah. people in and when they, yeah. um, you know, yeah, and then, pop them then, out. Then there'll be some top-up finance coming up down yeah. the track at construction stage. All, you know, we teach all that, how to do all that. And we, yeah, went over it. Then we went on to pretty much communication, which was my jam. Mm. So that was really around just speaking in people's language, you know, use, using... Yeah, yeah understanding how they want to hear something and telling them in that way. If, they want to, if they've if they got a lot of questions, they want a lot of information, give it to them. If they're touchy-feely and they want to talk about that sort yep. of thing, I just broke it down. <laughs> yeah, broke it down to personalities and just told people how we like to hear stuff yeah. and understand who how you like to hear it and then recognise it's not always how other people like to hear it. Some of you tonight, today listening to this podcast will like, I speak quite directly, Bob speaks more, uh, what is it like, more storytell style, really. Yeah, hey. yeah. Well, yeah, I do tell a lot of stories. But yeah, but that's your style, and mm. some people will love that more. I'm yeah, more bullet very point talking. Explanatory, I'll enlarge on things. You'll be more bullet point straight to Direct, the, yeah. Straight to the I do envy. I envy. I wish I could do it like you sometimes. I think, oh, it'd be great to be able to speak like that. I'm like, I'm like done. 10 minutes. See ya. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> I go not, under I'm time. Not, I'm not the one that's won the big awards at Toastmasters. You have. So oh, well, yeah, well, yeah, you're you more than capable of uh, doing it. I, I, I do a different sort of speaking from the 
Toastmaster speaking. Yeah, I suppose, or mine's more stage speaking. Mm. Okay, so after that, when then we talked about professionalism and information memorandums and covering off on that information. Then after that, we well, we went to capital raising. And I just thought here, yep. you might like to cover off on the 2012 10 rule. 2012 2. So, sorry, 2. Oh, sorry, I wrote yeah. that wrong number. Oh. Oops. I don't want to give. T- okay. I've got to be careful what I say about about uh, um, legalities, but but when we were covering capital raising, we talked about you know the difference between you know you can raise capital from one person. It's, I wouldn't really call that a capital raising, but if if uh, if, if somebody loaned you money, to, that's a form of capital raising. But once you get into multiple people, yes, you know, and and then you start to need to set up a structure, uh, perhaps a you know unit trust or whatever it is to raise capital. So you've got to be very careful about the law because there's a thing called the Corporations Act, which dictates not only how corporations and companies work, but how things like capital raising work, managed investment schemes. I mean, mm. there's, there's a lot of a lot of legalities around it all, and not everybody, well, very few people understand it, mm. and a lot of lawyers don't understand it. Mm. Like you know, you know, a lot of property lawyers, for instance, don't understand it because it's more there's specialised lawyers, corporation lawyers. Mm that have got a much better idea. Uh, but even then, you know, I've had uh, varying uh, opinions from experts in that area as well on things over the years. There's, there's a lot more case law out there now. But, yeah, it's there are ways of raising funds for small offers mm. uh, that, that still require a certain amount of legality, but, but a lot less than, uh, you know, than how it started off. When all this legislation started off about capital raising, it was really to cover the big companies, the big end of town, and but little, it go- little guys. Little guys, like guys us. though, doesn't it? Well, it impacted us little guys who just didn't want to raise, you know, a hundred million in the market, and uh, but we had to co- cope with all the rules that they originally brought in. But mm. over a period of time, they sort of loosened up and made certain allowances for smaller developers like ourselves who are raising capital for our projects, uh, calling, you know small offers and there's um, you know a few relaxations in there that uh, you're best to talk to a, a corporate lawyer about but yeah you have to you've got to be a bit careful uh, when you reach a point where you can't are, just go out and post on public forums that you're looking for money it's actually illegal yeah you can do well, it and... well without the correct uh, licensing you can't yeah but there are some uh, things you can do without publicly advertising, and yeah. without having to go to the you know the full blown, uh, you know, unlisted public company responsible entity, all that sort of stuff. But Didn't you say in the early days when you first learned, like years ago, before people were doing it, and you started posting on some pages, they just crashed, pulled you down, or something? Oh, I know that was Facebook when I was doing, when I had a an ebook, I had an ebook out, oh, I don't know, probably twenty oh nine. It was called How to Make $2,000 an Hour in Your Spare Time, which was doing the property development mm. because I can easily prove that you can make $2,000 an hour in your spare time doing yeah. a project. Uh, in fact, I can show you how you can make three or four times that in your spare time doing a project as well. Uh, but but they said it was too risque. It was too, you know, I said, I'm happy to, happy to sit down and prove it. <laughs> yeah. And they said, oh, well, we can't sort of leave you have that title. And I said, well, Pr- prove it's wrong. And they said, well, no, you've got to prove it's right. And so happy to prove it's right. Oh, but we don't want to know. <laughs> long, <laughs> the short of, yeah. long the short of it is I, ha- I kept the same book, but then I changed it, How to Get Started in Property Development, mm. which was so boring. But anyway, it kept them happy. Uh, it was only the cover I changed. But, yeah, that was that's what that was about. Oh, a bit early days. Early days, really, yes. early. Well, hey, while we were on capital raising, can I do mm. a wee plug for myself here? Do it. So I'm the capital raiser here. You always. And I've currently got four different things going on. So if you're interested in a self-managed super fund opportunity and an equity opportunity and a loan opportunity or joining a group of females to do a project together. Ah, ladies' developments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're interested in any so- of those, uh, you're welcome to reach out. It was interesting. I did put that in an email a couple of weeks ago and I had three males come up to me at the workshop and say, I really want my wife to get involved in this. So that was kind of nice to hear mm. that people look at it and think, oh, I'd really quite like that. So that's uh, a couple. But we always have things going on and... Yeah, it's kind of nice to... Contact Hillary. Yeah, I always feel like you can contact me because if I don't have something but we may have a mentoring student uh, that we could 
you know, support as well. It's always h- handy to have um, things going on. But right now, I do have a few things going on. We've got some industrial some opportunities, yeah. some great seventeen percent returns, uh, Mes Finance thing going on. And if they all sound way too confusing, you can reach out to me and I can send you information memorandums or have simple. a. It is simple. Like if I can manage it, you can manage it. Making money made simple. Oh yes. Oh, that was um, Noel Whitaker's book many years ago. Oh, was it? Yeah. Well, now I think we call it the armchair developer strategies. Oh, well, that's our book. That's ours. Yeah, the yes. one I was talking about was from a financial planner called Noel Whitaker. Yeah, and what did he do? Oh, I, well, he wrote a book called Making Money Made Easy, which was just teaching people about money, the difference between good debt, bad debt, you know, mm. all, all the basic stuff that you don't get taught in school. Mm. I gave that to my son Luke when he was 14, changed his life. Uh, he became uh, what he is. <laughs> Are you just going to leave that there? No, he's a well, financial planner now, isn't he? Well, he is. He, he, he runs an Australian arm of a New York-based um, high net worth. Uh, if you haven't got twenty million net, you can't even get a discussion with him. But yeah, that's what he does these days. But it all started off back at Noel Whittaker's book. Oh, there you go. You're taking and, your own uh, that one. Go. Yeah. Go. Well, you know that, that immediately started him saving money and uh, and uh, you know being well, he's still got his first dollar. Course. Yeah. His first dollar pocket money I gave him when he was seven, he's still got that. Somewhere. Oh, really? It's just stacked away under his mattress, or would he put it in a bank for? Yeah, the other two didn't take after him, but um, they, but they're successful in their own ways. Oh, everyone's got their own way of doing it, that's for sure. He was actually the person that made the property mastermind calculator, so he's very detail orientated, loves that sort of analytical stuff. Mm. And um, he's very... almost as crazy as Aaron, who works with us in yeah. our mentoring program, who dreams spreadsheets. I don't think Luke even dreams them, but Aaron does. No, he definitely he does. does. righty oh, Bob. Then we went on to the documentation required. Mm. And, and the, I mean, a lot of these topics feed into each other and they are all part of each other, but the documentation required for for joint ventures and capital yeah. raising and, and you, you know, other people's money and yeah, we, loans and that right. sort of thing. Yeah. We talked about information memorandums. Yeah. You know, simple ones, simple sort of eight, ten page ones. And also the larger ones that could be 20 to 25 pages that we use ourselves when we're doing a capital raising that needs to com- uh, you know, conform with ASIC reg- regulations. You're handling those things all the time. Yeah, I don't make them. Yeah, make them. I make them. Well, makes them. I just I just handle them. But uh, you, you handle them. So information memorandums yep. in, in a couple of different types. We talked about joint venture agreements. Yes. You no, know, between uh, different parties. We talked about... Did we talk about non-disclosures, Bob? I don't remember well, if I didn't we get, did. didn't get down to that sort of detail. No. Oh, I was talking about the major documentation. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The reason uh, I asked, it could have been when I was sleeping, you see. You only fit so much into two days. Yeah. Yep. But um, also project management agreements, which yep. can often form part of a joint venture agreement. And, uh, yeah, things like if you're establishing a, a trust, you know, tr- you need a trustee, the company, you know, you need a... Um, obviously a constitution and uh, sometimes like a unit holders agreement, a shareholders agreement. So we went through that sort of things you're likely to need. Uh, the good news is, of course, um, all you need is a really clever accountant who's exceptionally good on structures and a really good uh, lawyer and the, you know, get the tax side sorted out with the accountant and the legal side sorted out with the lawyer and uh, they'll, they'll help with the required uh, documentation. Yeah. And That's the other thing you must do is know what you're doing. So no. I just need, while we're here, we cannot learn property development from podcasts. No. We, can, we can learn little bits and pieces, but you really do need to invest in yourself, don't you? Oh, yeah. The, it goes without saying. The, down, the downside of not doing it is um, not very palatable. No, at all. And then, Bob, we went into uh, syndicates. Talked a bit about syndicates, yeah. Yeah. Done lots and lots of those over the years, and but, well, well, we're involved in one at the moment, aren't we? Um, our, our industrial one. Uh, we've got others coming up, of course. Other industrial ones. John, I know you're you're filling some of that at the moment, but it's a syndicate in respect that you know there's a number of investors in it. It's also a joint venture because it's with us. It's a bit of a mixture, isn't it? It's yeah. a capital raising as well. There's sort yeah. of three so things in the one project. One. And one thing you did cover off on was who does what when you do a joint venture and how to manage that mm. working with people or, or what say people have because it's really important mm. that it's clear who's doing what. Yeah, yeah. Re- really good detailed documentation is yeah. important. Uh, you know, not just any old lawyer but the right lawyer needs to get involved in that. Yeah. And you need to uh, you, you need to give some instructions of your own as well. Mm. Uh, 
and you know can't leave it all up to the lawyer and it was all topped off with some absolutely fabulous networking yeah so that was pretty much everything we covered we had lots of morning Q&A's. tea afternoon, afternoon tea, tea lunch, lunch and, and saturday night evening sunday night was brilliant wasn't it wasn't it just oh, goodness we <laughs> took over the whole place yeah. yeah we did it was it was fantastic and the networking that went on was really worthwhile. So people connected with each other and mm. and now like some people that. were there that had money that wanted yeah. to invest. Some people were there looking for investors and some were there just to learn about it, I yeah. think, too, yeah. and, and maybe plant that seed for how they can move forward. Yeah. I love moving around to little the groups of people, you know. Yeah. Uh, like I, I mentioned to somebody, I feel like a bee bouncing around flowers, you know, collecting pollen, but... You know, just to sort of drop in, you know, three or four people talking there. One would be talking about a, a project that he's got underway. Somebody else would be saying, oh, "I'm an investor in this thing," and yeah. you know, and uh, or our little, our new little friends, Jared and Chris. They not listen. Hey guys, them just talking about their big dreams and what they're going to do next and how they're going to go forward. And I yeah. can't wait to see that happen. Yeah, well, they're very successful in in other fields, and so obviously integrating into this. And yeah, yeah, it's exciting stuff all around. Everyone, everyone there pumped yes and I, I just love hearing the stories everyone's got going on what yep. they're doing what yep. their plans are so uh, that was kind of the full two days yeah. a, a lot of networking when, when a lot you of think fun. about it there's a, so many people there are involved in property development they're not just mm. lookers they're not just you know making up the numbers hey someone, someone came that. up to me and said i go to plenty of events and it's almost like everyone in this room is or is just about to, or has been like they are property developers, and in comparison with other things he goes to, he said it's nothing like our ratio. Mm. Everyone, everyone's just fully into it, which was just oh, yeah. awesome. So that was pretty much our weekend. What a weekend! What a weekend! We, our flights were delayed getting home. It was such a long, long day Sunday. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. we got back home and we're back on the back oh, on the are. horse. So we got well, we've got a few more things coming up this year. Oh, we do. We've got our three-day workshop, the property development workshop in October, and that's the 11th, 12th, and 13th in the Gold Coast. And if you are keen to come, just let us know earlier. Don't wait till the last Yeah, week. because you don't want to miss out. And we are sort of starting that already. I think that started last week, The mm. all the details with the venue. So we sort of kick into that reasonably early. But other than that, Bob, mm. I think it, it was a very successful event. And I think that people that came along will be really moving forward yeah. at, you know, well. Well, we know that. But we've just covered off everything we covered. Was mm. there anything else that we covered that? Oh, and I think uh, you, you've worked off our agenda there. That's That was it. But oh, the one thing, we actually went through a couple of case studies as well. Yeah. That so we had a couple of uh, people that are in our mentoring program went through theirs and then we had went through a couple of hours that we have going on as well mm. just to show people yeah. what's possible. It's good, it's good to talk about, you know, real things. Yes. Real, real projects that are going on from the little to the medium and... Uh, you know how how they how they started. You know how they found the deals, how they got structured, whole thing, finance, mm. approvals, marketing, construction, all that, at the back end. Yeah, the whole thing. I love. I, I just love hearing about other people's projects. Well, Bob, I think that's it. Um, unless you've got another mantra, and I'll read out of my daily mantras. Bob. I'm going to save this mantra, these <laughs> daily mantras, because I, you put me on the spot so often with. Um, oh, you got a tip for the day, and I think, oh, no, oh, oh. So yeah, I think there's one for every day. So there's every, Bob. Do you know how many are in here? The, the, it's got like, one for every day. More every... than that. It's got like four hundred pages. There's hundred. It's, it's a very thick book. Daily mantras. Mm. So right. is that going to be your new? Well, it could be. I think I'll keep it handy. Yes. Just in case I can't come up with one. All right. You know, usually I come up with one about fishing or later sporting results. Yes. But no, the daily mantra. Speaking of sporting, mm. uh, isn't Australia doing well in the Olympics? Yep, so are. Uh, how's, how's New Zealand going? We don't, I don't, we think... don't see a lot here. No, you Probably don't. A, maybe if we're in New Zealand, we'd see more. But, but I don't know, you don't see it here. Oh, I, just get, I just get Popular. to follow the Australians. Well, sevens, is the men's playing sevens? Oh, New Zealand got knocked out of the sevens, and Australia mm. got fourth, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. They'd... Well, there you go. There you go. Well, that's about it, Bob. That's the end of Joint Ventures Unpacked. We do have a masterclass coming up soon i'm not sure of the exact dates but we'll start talking about that we hope you got something out of this podcast and maybe we've opened your eyes as to what's possible but i think what we also wanted to do was to tell you that it's action takers that move forward in life and it's 
just committing to your own growth and you can't sit on the sidelines and think about it and you can't try and do it without having to invest in yourself you know these people that came along last weekend all of them like wow you know that was amazing and they just know that it's propelled them forward so you know if you're a fence sitter just think it's not going to take you where you want to go in life get involved hey yeah life's too short to sit on the fence or think no, you wait for something to, to happen yes yeah yeah anyway no. emmet books in the post it was yep. great meeting you and we'll catch up with you all very soon bye for now bye now